Final ending of the J, part 1 down below. Celeste had agreed to collaborate with the Food Network for 13 episodes, primarily focusing on Southeast restaurants. She was in Vancouver in one episode and California in another. Instead of accompanying her to California, we decided to make the journey to Canada into a vacation. Celeste was seeing a senior producer who worked on the production, and the four of us had a great time together. In one of the nicer hotels, we had two suites, one with a hot tub. One evening, after a few beers, we really startled her new partner by forcing him to use the bathtub. Celeste's body had always been good, but after training with Jody, it was truly spectacular. Before leaving, we spent a further 20 minutes inside. George and Celeste didn't appear hurried, and I smiled as I thought back to our most recent tub date. Candle it if you wish. It's not my responsibility to clean it. They had a clear view of Jimmy once more as I carried her into the bedroom. Jimmy was fiercer during the night. The next morning, I made fun of her. Last night, something definitely motivated you. Though flushed, she smiled. Possibly. You know, you're not exactly small, but has appeared. Unbelievable. How does Celeste handle that, I wonder? That's when I realized there would be a girl chat episode soon. As Celeste was the ad executive managing Jimmy's career, and Celeste was doing a fantastic job, so Jimmy got to travel with her. We negotiated a deal when Home and Garden inquired about the other show we had pitched. She would perform 10 episodes a year for them and 20 for the Food Network, which would leave her with about 10 weeks for personal appearances and vacation each year. She would spend the next few weeks decompressing. Even the idea of one or two books serving as companion pieces was discussed. The production firm was doing quite well. After a few years of labor, the boys completed their animated short, which was nominated for an Oscar. Even though they didn't win, they received a lot of attention and employment opportunities as a result. I decided I had done everything I could for them and started looking for other projects. Update. A few months later, Jimmy approached me with the anxious expression of a scoutmaster, priest facing a district attorney. Can I ask you something? No. She appeared surprised. What? Well, I figured I'd respond stupidly because it was a foolish question. What are your thoughts? Kindly give me a chance to speak before responding. I would like to perform in amateur theater once more. Not in our community. They don't even like having me in the crowd, for heaven's sake. No, I'd like to join the theater guild that Jensenville is forming. The tiny village of Jensenville was 15 miles distant. Less than 5,000 people, I believe, lived in the entire town. I took a moment to consider it. I'm not too keen on that idea. Please, my dear. This year, they only intend to present three plays. They are in dire need of someone with any kind of experience. You don't seem to be too busy right now, so you could join as well. We might enjoy it together. Do they know about the last production you were in? When she answered, she blushed a little. Not at all. Plus, I'd prefer that no one bring it up in conversation. Roy, please. I didn't say it out, but I miss the tranquility of mind I formerly enjoyed. Allow me to introduce you to them. We'll proceed accordingly. That evening, Sure thanked him three times. It had not occurred in a long time. The fact that I had no meetings the following morning was fortunate. We had a get-together. They appeared uneasy and inexperienced. The English teacher and drama coach at the local senior high school served as their leader. Although he had majored in drama, he was forced to accept any job after graduating from college. He had even performed in a couple off-Broadway shows and traveled the country performing Oklahoma with a road company during the summer. He let out a sigh. For me, it's more of a pipe dream. Before moving here, I was a very active member of the theater guild in a big town. I spoke with a few of my old acquaintances there, and they offered to give me a few of their old sets in addition to encouraging me to do this. While some of the enthusiastic students at my school have experience in theater, the majority are merely housewives, production workers, or office professionals who have no idea what they're getting into. Some may give up because it's not what they expected it to be, and some will give up when they realize how much time they'll need to devote. The others of us will simply continue. I valued his candor. I also liked that they appeared to be largely moral individuals who disapproved of anything obscene. You ever see a production of an illicit affair? The teacher, Bob, was wearing a disgusted expression. Yes, I have. It wasn't well received by the audience and was very awful. The most frequent comment was on an offensive topic. They closed it after just one performance. Did it have the bedroom scene in it? Hell no. Nobody that I've ever heard of had the audacity to leave it in. The clear answer to the question of whether that's something we're leaning towards is no. Farmers, craftsmen, and factory workers from small towns make up this group, thus they wouldn't be in favor of it. I thought the guy was cute. When I wasn't tied up, Jimmy dragged me along as she fully submerged herself in the group. When putting on their first ever production, they were all utterly terrified. Jimmy was listed as assistant director on the playbill, but he wasn't in it. The first time, there weren't many people in the crowd, and I believe it disappointed them. I assured them that the next time would be better. Then they performed Into the Woods, the kid-friendly rendition. Jimmy informed them how good of a cow I was, so they drafted me to perform the role. The 16-year-old girl who played the lead was so outstanding that she ended up taking center stage. Due to the fact that McCoy Investing, Inc., 
one of the corporate sponsors, purchased every ticket and distributed them to the public. The venue was full. I ensured that every woman in the show, even those behind the scenes, received a bouquet of roses, and I watched as the applause at the final curtain continued for 15 minutes. When they mingled after the show, they were all dressed in costume. The cow head was on me. A young girl, maybe seven years old, came up and prodded me. Moo! She exclaimed with a giggle. She and her buddies giggled even harder when I mooed in return. I invited Celeste to the show because Jimmy was involved in the production. I reasoned that she would benefit from the routine of her home after taping one of her episodes. As she was being escorted by a network executive, he started making fun of the production, but she struck him in the stomach. Hard. You behaved after getting the hint. In consideration for the children involved in the play, the after-party was hosted at an ice cream shop. They had to prolong the run by one more week since the local paper made a big deal out of it. They all paid for the tickets, so I don't think there was an empty seat in the house. After attending a meeting regarding a potential project, I returned home to find Jimmy and Celeste seated at our kitchen table, with nearly half of the bottle of wine gone. They were chatting away about her play date. She smiled when she saw me. Our first and last date was that one. Had he gone in costume, that is. He was the person, maybe. Once their laughter subsided, she informed us that his sole purpose in accompanying her was to get her to leave our production firm by offering her immense fame and financial gain in exchange for signing with him. Jimmy inquired about her story from her. I told him I would consider it if he kissed my behind at high noon in our largest mall's food court and allowed me time to promote. That evening, he departed. Jody introduced me to my next project. She often went to a tavern in her hometown, which had been a landmark for many years, but the proprietor had passed away. His widow listed it for sale because she lacked the motivation and expertise to maintain it. Jody wanted me to work with her to bring the place back to life. I agreed to look it over because I didn't have anything going on and bar owner wasn't on my resume yet. Jimmy and Celeste accompanied me, and within 15 minutes they were giggling uncontrollably. As it turned out, it was an alternate lifestyle bar with a predominantly transgender clientele, mixed with gays and lesbians. Within 30 minutes, we were all hit on, even with Jody and the manager. Though vast, the location has seen better days. Though maybe not in this iteration, I could see promise. We first discussed it in the owner's office before heading out to find Jimmy and Celeste. Jimmy was dancing with an extremely lovely transsexual woman, while Celsie was surrounded by males getting shots at a table. They were keen to give her a wonderful time because they knew her from her shows. Jody used the occasion to show me around, and I eventually found myself seated at a table with three tea girls. One was smaller than Jimmy and a very gorgeous blonde. Another, who identified herself as a person of color, was really attractive. Her artist must have been a genius since she looked incredibly authentic and had many of them on show. The third had a Latina figure that was typical of a woman. They were persuasive enough, explaining the possibilities of the space and the benefits of a makeover, but above all they wanted to transform it from a bar and hookup factory. We were able to have a chat with them when we were sufficiently distanced from the DJ. Every three months, they discussed scheduling exotic dancers who specialized to their specialty and inviting fashion gurus to speak. They even discussed sponsored teams in sports. We make the ideal target. All of us, gay, trans, and lesbian, always have good careers, and very few of us have kids, so we have far more money than most people to spare. Imagine how much more money you could have in your pocket if we lived in a secure and comfortable environment. I paid more attention to the small blonde who spoke the most because I discovered she was an accountant. Each of the three contributed to the conversation and possessed skills. We were so engrossed in it that we failed to notice the girls approaching. Jimmy smiled and settled down. Girls, give it up. I'm not going to let him start exploring. He's mine. The Hispanic woman smiled. Sugar, don't automatically pass up this chance. I can play for both teams so we could get along great. Getting this white boy to eat a Latina, Asian sandwich would be my dream. Before Desiree, I had no time to blush leapt in. Count me in girls. The blonde Amy spoke up. What am I, a liver chopped? Put me in that small pile. Celeste was laughing so hard that she was thumping the table, and I was glowing. Rubbing my arm, one of the gay males who had followed leaped in. Sugary, put those hoes away. Allow me to demonstrate what a true good time is like. We ended up piling three tables high and turning it into a party. I ended up dancing with every single person, including the guy, when the DJ turned it up. Every time I got on the dance floor, a slow song would start a minute later, so they must have bought the DJ off. I decided to go with it as it would eventually create a fantastic story. I'm glad we didn't have to take the car back to the motel. I hardly recall getting into bed at all. We all staggered out of our rooms, staring at one another. A single word. Do you hear me? Nothing concerning yesterday night. The women smiled. Jody's smile got bigger. I will remain silent. In addition, I took a ton of images. Celeste had her laptop in her hand. Jody, don't worry. We're all over the place's Facebook page as potential owners. A lovely photo of Roy and Chuck dancing is included. Isn't he cute as hell cuddled up with Roy, girls? Not that we were all swarming around, she said. Every one of us was captured in photos. 
Jimmy was dancing at the guy's table, face to cheek with Desiree and Celeste, all of whom were trying to kiss her cheek simultaneously. Jody and the Latina locked lips. We all thought it was fortunate that we were away from town and questioned whether any of our friends were club members. Jody asked me what I thought after breakfast. It has undeniable promise. You know, you have enough money to purchase the property outright. Why are you in need of me? I wish to know what you know. This might be a treasure trove. But above all, I wish you luck. I'm not always lucky. I'll take a chance because of your past performance. Although I would really like to accomplish this, I won't proceed alone. We ultimately created an LLC and purchased the property. It took more work than we anticipated to have the bar rebuilt and up and running. So for a time we were there once or twice a week. Since we couldn't make the commute, we always stayed the night. I asked Jimmy if spending so much time with Jody would make her envious. She was putting on her work clothes. You ever think she might just be a switch hitter? I think before you start playing the field you better think about the grand slam you have at home. She was taking off her underwear by that point, and she arrived at work late. After four weeks, we were nearly finished. Two weeks from now was the big reopening. To ensure that our patrons wouldn't forget us, we kept a tiny portion of the club open. Every Thursday, the majority of the regulars arrived for an update tour. I was fortunate enough to hire Desiree as a consultant after learning that she was a true interior designer. When I told Jody as much, she only gave me a grunt. I informed you. You seem like the kind of person who could walk into a barrel of guys and grab a woman with both hands. Whoa, that's a comparison I never would have considered. It was difficult for Jimmy and me to spend quality time together. She was with the theater group if I wasn't busy. She was knee-deep in helping them choose the plays they wanted to do for the next season. Jimmy's idea to perform Rocky Horror was swiftly rejected due to the community's strong conservative beliefs. Celeste was away filming her upcoming Home and Garden series, thus her time in the former group would be short. They had a strict timeline, aiming to complete all ten performances within five weeks. When the club did open, it was crowded with patrons. People were being turned away quite early, and those who were turned away were given gold passes that guaranteed them a spot at the front of the queue the next time around. The pass included a free initial drink. Tina, the trans Latina I'd met the first night, was our new manager. Despite having a degree in hospitality management, it appears that she struggled to get employment in her sector. My demand was for a security crew. Three ladies and five men, each with professional training to man the club, two kept an eye on the parking area, and one kept a close eye on everything via monitors in their small office. Everyone was connected and could quickly come together in the event of an emergency. Until I presented the statistics on how fragile people leading alternative lifestyles were, Tina felt that it was a bit over the top. She didn't say anything more when two of the bouncers turned away two carloads of men who wanted to humiliate someone. Additionally, the club had solid relations with the local police department. There was always a pot of coffee and pastries in the office, usually made by one of the patrons, and two members of the security team were retired police officers. Everyone became more at ease as time went on and the incident rate of calls virtually vanished. Every month, Jody and I made it a point to come in order to take care of our investments and resolve any issues. Amy informed me that the softball team is playing in the mixed leagues, and the last time we were there, they were hosting a drag queen competition. She chuckled. Gays, lesbians, and trans, we got all the bases covered. The trophy, which they went on to win that year, is kept in a display cabinet next to the front door with a team photo above it. Owners from neighboring places would frequently come and bring fresh ideas with them. Occasionally, they left a few. I made an annual review appointment at my accountants. My net worth was approximately $4 million, primarily allocated to various business endeavors. It projected that my value will triple in 10 years and double in 4. After giving it some thought, I made the decision to take a few days off. I reasoned that this would be a great moment to have a family. Jimmy took me by surprise in two different ways. She didn't seem to be all that excited about beginning a family, and she wasn't as delighted as I imagined she would be that I would be home pretty much all the time for a while. I could feel our window closing, and she was 34 years old and I was 38. A month later, at a performance, I recognized a familiar face in the audience, and that's when everything started to fall apart. Before I could get close, the guy vanished, but it looked a lot like Jack. Then I noticed another well-known face while perusing the playbill. Philip. According to his bio, he was an amateur theatric enthusiast and former professional actor who was a local businessman. When I joined Jimmy in their post-production mingling, my stomach started to turn. She sensed how I was feeling, remained motionless, and only moved when I did. We didn't talk about it until we were headed home. So, when were you going to tell me Philip had joined your troupe? He's been with us for not too long, my love, and we don't really see each other. I work on the next production and skip the one if I find out he's in it. I must remind you that nothing occurred, and nothing will happen, those years ago. I knew that would make you angry, so I kept it a secret. I believe I spotted Jack in the crowd, you know. You might have. After their divorce, he and Philip moved in together to save money, and they appeared to enjoy each other's company. I guess similar lives. I told him to keep his distance and we would get along well in our one and only conversation. 
Please don't be alarmed. I make sure I'm never alone with any of them since I'm a big lady and can handle myself. Too many unpleasant recollections. I couldn't get them out of my head, even though we had some of the best times we'd had in a long time. She sounded convincing. She started working longer hours. When I questioned Bob and Jan, they both told me that the company was in the midst of making a national pitch to a client and that everyone was working hard to make it work. She tended to guard her phone like it was gold and never left it lying around, I noticed. I felt extremely unhappy about it all, especially when you factored in the excessive amount of time she was spending preparing for the new play. I spoke with the major when I dropped by the investigative agency. He had held that rank in the army, and the designation stayed because many of the staff members were veterans. He sighed after we had some alone time together in his office. Roy, are you sure you want to take this path? You seem to have a good explanation for everything you told me, but if this is just your paranoia, she won't make a very happy wife. Before I made the choice, Major, I gave it a lot of thought. If you have the time, investigate it. All right. If you can get your hands on her phone, the simplest way would be to hack it. She's familiar with me and many of the crew from your events, so we'll probably subcontract much of this. Recall that during the murder mystery, she conducted interviews with the majority of us. Have you got a deadline? It ought should take a week or two. You have no idea how much I'd like to hear from you that I told you so. He let out a sigh. I'll get going tomorrow. When will I be able to access her phone? I needed to consider it. She carried it with her all the time, save from when she was charging. Is it possible to send a man around after midnight? Most likely, that's the only time I have access to it. Tomorrow evening. It will go much more quickly if he does it from his van. I made sure we had a really lively session that night despite feeling like a jerk. After that, she cuddled up to me and fell asleep right away. After an hour, I watched her flip over, carefully remove her phone from the charger, and head out the patio door. The fact that he was sitting there in the darkness scared me a little. Without even returning to the van, he worked from the patio table while connecting his laptop to his phone. He uttered a faint crap. Almost instantly. What? She has installed anti-hack software. Very advanced material. Could you bring her laptop to me? To get it, I had to steal back into the house very stealthily. After carrying it to the van and connecting a few cords, he labored tirelessly for a while before letting out a sigh and relaxing. I got it. I found it and reset the programming to prevent it from ever appearing. I require your phone. He took a few actions with it after I gave it to him, then gave it back. You got a tracker app and a remote viewing program. What does that mean exactly? You therefore require a second phone. Your phone was cloned by someone else, and now everything you say, text, and do over the phone is being reported to them. Oh no, this might turn out badly. I conducted the majority of my business over the phone. Don't touch yours, and don't reveal too much information. Try not to get made by using it too much. Tomorrow afternoon, I'll have one ready for you in the office, and it will be as secure as I can make it. I ought to be able to identify who is receiving your information by then. What do I do now? He gave a shrug. Return everything to its original position and head back to bed. Make an effort to sleep. Stay as close to your routine as possible. Give it to her if she wants to cuddle. Play if she wants to. Don't become hostile if she doesn't respond to you. Simply accept it. Recall that we have no idea what we're in for. She may be faithful to you even though she's involved in questionable activities. We must locate the participants and ascertain the nature of the game. I'll be by tomorrow if I can't finish it today. Avoid calling us. We'll give you a call. You will still be considered a part owner. We may say, for example, that you should come look at some spreadsheets and discuss ideas about branching out. Unexpectedly, I slept like a newborn. Hesitating did not help me flourish in business. When I discovered a flaw in something, I was willing to take it on head on. The idea that the most significant financial commitment I had ever made would soon be shown to be a waste of time made me very unhappy. Two days later, they called. When Jimmy heard me pick up the phone, he inquired as to what I was discussing. The major would like me to stop by and discuss about taking risks. She grinned. Let me guess, he's found a new way of peeking in windows to get the goods. I smiled, seeing her wriggle at my response. These days, little much gets done unless the client requests live photos. These days, social media and computers are used for almost everything. The majority of agencies that are worth their salt employ one or two nerds who can bypass firewalls and crack security codes more quickly than a squirrel can open a pecan. No, the major is not in need of assistance there. He's asking me to think about allowing him to set up a personal security section. You know, extra club security if a lot of well-known people are there, bodyguards, escorts when a man or lady doesn't feel secure in public, that kind of stuff. It might be quite successful. They want to present their proposal now that they have it together. There's likely to be a PowerPoint presentation, given Jason's background. Would you like to attend? Her nose furrowed. Not at all. It sounds incredibly dull. I have a guild meeting, too. I'm going to be late. My response took her by surprise. These days, aren't you always? I'm not going to wait. What? Before she could get any farther, I was out the door. The major was not grinning as he greeted me at the door. Jason handed me a pair of headphones when he looked up and saw me wearing them. 
Jimmy was the first voice I heard. Guys, no games are fun tonight. Roy seems a little irritated with me for taking so long to come here. There's only so much I can defend. A whiny male voice, later identified as Jack, began. Oh no, tonight, I was hoping to have a little fun. The sound of Philip's voice still rang in my ears. Jack, please calm down. We're able to wait. It's almost here. Once there, we all vanished to live a very happy life in the Caymans. Jimmy laughed. You two can comfort each other, at least. In addition, I'm horny, and tonight I'm going to blow Roy away. I'm actually going to step it up a little. Maintain his composure and ease. In addition, I need to obtain as much as I can because he makes a decent lover. Jack started to complain, but she interrupted him. Jack, get over yourself. Return to Philip at home. Philip chuckled. He did that prior to the play because he was so excited about seeing you today. Jimmy laughed. You're a lucky boy. It was almost too much for me to handle when he used it on me the other night. You'll have strange gate tomorrow. Jason turned the headphones off. How? I have complete access because I copied her phone. Every word she says, whether in person or over the phone, is recorded. He winced. She speaks a lot. I had to apply a filter to make it just turn on after specific words. Then I had to take it down since she had divulged some of their plans. We now have to pay attention to every word. My ears ached. I'll hand things over to the major. I was correct to anticipate that the man would not mince words. At least one more guy and two women are being slept by her. With the exception of the final male lover, we know their names and biographies and will have them by tomorrow. I was blown away. How? Why? I thought she loved me. She carried out. She still does, in my opinion, a little. I've heard that while her goal isn't to destroy you, she does want all of your readily available funds, including the prenuptial trust fund you set up. All right, then. It now had 300,000 in it, plus an additional 40,000 in our checking account. If she received everything, my investment capital of little over 600,000 would have come to just under a million dollars. Although a million dollars was a substantial sum of money, it was not something that would last her a lifetime. I informed the major as much. It appears like she has picked up on you. She intends to use the funds to open a franchise for donuts. She checked him out and answered a call from the owner asking you to invest. As your wife and an advertising executive, she even made the trip to see him. She seems to believe the location could be a gold mine, as do her lovers. She's sacrificing our lives for donuts. Really? Why not? Jason came back into the discussion. Her lovers seem to have convinced her that you're having affairs. With who? Along with Amy, Jody, and Celeste. They even claim that you have all shared beds. I exhaled. I'm a busy little beaver, damn it. Celeste and I have never shared a bed, and it has been five weeks since our last phone conversation. Amy is a transgender who works as the club's accountant and Jody is a devout lesbian who doesn't think men are useful. Additionally, I don't swing that way, before you ask. What do I do now? The Major grinned, a smile that would have terrified anyone he was questioning. We now have unquestionable truth. The discussions that we have are not permitted to be used and are prohibited. We can monitor their whereabouts and be present when they assemble using them. Your prenuptial agreement is upheld after we receive images and audio. It won't take us long, in my opinion. You have to take a few days off from work very soon. Additionally, we must install audio and video recorders around your home. Though I doubt they'd be foolish enough to carry it out in your home, you never know. Thursday is coming up. She's at work, so you can finish it then. I'll let her know tonight that I might not return until Sunday because I have to leave town on Friday. This will merely present her with the opportunity. She already has the motivation. Update. I returned home. What more could I do? Fortunately, I stayed long enough to take a sleeping pill that I periodically used while traveling and by the time she arrived home, I was almost completely out of it. After sliding into bed and massaging me, Jimmy immediately quit up when I didn't reply. While lying there, I wondered how many more evenings we would have as husband and wife. I informed her that I would be heading to Cleveland at around noon. What the hell is in Cleveland? A security company that is failing as a result of bad management. I'm headed to the personnel evaluation with the major. The interview should be finished by tomorrow, but it might take until Sunday. Her voice carried a hint of bitterness. And you're telling me now. I gave a shrug. I was unaware of it until last evening. It was brought up during our meeting. In just two days, it has the potential to be highly profitable. What I'm saying is, let's arrange to take a vacation the following week. Somewhere sunny, warm, and undiscovered. We've never been to the Caymans, but I've heard they're lovely at this time of year. I want to make sure you know how much I adore you because I feel like we're drifting apart recently. The mention of Caymans made her wince, but she quickly got over it. Jimmy was truly moved, or she had grown as an actress far more than I realized. When she kissed me, her eyes were filled with tears. Honey, I'd adore that. Instead, let's head to that location in Belize. Perhaps we can rent the same hut there and spend a few days completely immersed in our own world. Lying about it was one of the toughest things I'd ever had to do, and looking her in the eyes knowing it was never going to happen. I packed to go to Cleveland after she left. I was received at the airport by Jim, the major. I was actually going to Cleveland since he had already made plans to go, awaiting my approval. 
When we arrived, we completed the business portion really quickly, signing a year-long deal with three men and a woman. If they liked Cleveland, we could email them the details, and they could come at the scheduled time and location without even having to move. Jim smiled when we came to the motel. Keep your phone in the lodging area. If someone checks, your phone will make it appear as though you're staying. One of the new employees will pick it up at 7 and take it with him to a really fine restaurant that we will be paying for. After that, he's going to wander aimlessly across downtown for an hour or so before bringing it back to your hotel. She won't know if she calls because it will automatically forward to your new phone. I shivered, relieved that he supported me. We eventually arrived at a lovely country retreat. I was shocked to see Celeste, Jody, Bob and Jan from the advertising firm, Rick from the production company, and Chef Jean when we went to eat. Almost all of my business associates were there at the table. I gave the major a quick glance. More significantly than business, friendship ties us all to you. Roy, this is a sign of support. Son, you invest in more than just companies. Investing in people is a strength of yours. Whatever you decide to do, we're all behind you. I was completely overwhelmed. I was a relatively private person with few friends until I started my own business. I could glance around this table and know that these people were my friends, despite the fact that we were connected by business. Jody had one hand clamped down, while Celeste had the other. Jody coughed a few times after that. What do you need us to do? Well, some empty shoulders would be much appreciated for later sobbing. Jim has everything else covered. Everybody turned to stare at him. We're hearing rumors that they're throwing a huge after-play party tomorrow. Unbeknownst to them, but there will be a little higher than usual audience size. We will socialize with the attendees at the post-production get-together. Since it's a public space with no right of privacy, everything people say can be utilized there. We've already figured out where they're heading. There are many listening devices available that can record through walls, but we are not allowed to place anything in the suite they will be using legally. Furthermore, it is permissible to peek through and record via a window in the event that a curtain malfunction and doesn't close all the way and someone is in a position to view through it. From the beginning of the show until the conclusion of their evening, the entire group will be continuously filmed. Roy will undoubtedly have enough to maintain the prenuptial agreement and file for divorce on grounds of cause. He let out a sigh. There will be unintended consequences. Not to either of the players, but to the other man and both women. Roy, tell us how much you really want it to be. Do you want to burn her and her pals alive, or do you just want her to leave quietly? It works for me either way. Oh, and I scheduled a Monday morning at 10 a.m., meeting with what I believe to be the state's top divorce attorney. She sent me an email with a list of items you should bring, the most crucial of which is the prenuptial agreement document. I needed to consider it. Since they had never had reason to witness it, the most of my friends were unaware of it. But when I'm harmed, I can become a cruel and vengeful person. My partner intentionally bankrupted the business and played fast and loose with the money, causing one of my initial investments to fail. After I got well, I followed him around for a bit. Whenever he felt like things were going well, something would happen to pull him further behind. It took me four years to come to the conclusion that I had had my say. Jody said something while I was still thinking. Roy, don't ramble. Remain as resolute as you have always been. Stop it now and move on with your life. Jim shared his thoughts. You're correct. Roy, you don't need to be so sly. Simply set yourself free. His words released the tension, and everyone smiled. The drinking started. They were singing 50 ways to leave your lover at the top of their lungs when I went to bed. Some even used the correct words. When the phone rang the next morning, I was a little tipsy. My new ringtone appears to have been 50 ways to leave your lover. Jason was my suspicion. It still gave me a smile. Hello. Jimmy seemed content. Honey, good morning. How is Cleveland doing? It's much better than I had anticipated. There are many parks and greenways, it's clean, and the locals are welcoming. It's Cleveland, though. I'm excited to go home. I'll be glad when you're home too, honey. The good news is that I have an early morning flight. I think I can get home by 8. That caused a slight hiccup in her plans. She would have to shorten her enjoyment to ensure she could be at home when I got there. I wished she took a shower first. She stumbled a little but caught herself. It's fantastic. Recall that my play is this evening. I may have a slight irritability in the morning. The show would end before 10 o'clock. It began at 8. She might arrive home by 11.30, even after accounting for the social gathering. I gave in to a small jab. Don't get too excited, though. I am aware of your post-performance excitement. I swear to be a decent girl. By midnight, I should be in bed. Indeed, but with whom? That was all that was on my mind as I unplugged. Jim entered with a smile. I got her. That night, she wasn't by herself. She was in bed with a woman and the group's missing male as she was speaking with you. Your sleeping area. He is a member of the board. A board member who is married. The woman is wed in another county to a district attorney. Depending on how you choose to play, this might quickly become quite sticky. Yes, that's right. I was spared the wait. During the mingling that followed the play, I made the snap decision to pull the trigger. How much would it cost to hire the attorney to draft divorce decrees for adultery and get action for each player's alienation of affections? They will state their intent, even though I know they won't be legal. He appeared surprised. Christ, 
You don't back down from a decision once you've made it. Pun intended. You'll have to pay some money, but I can finish it. Move on it while I tell the group my plans. I met Celeste and Jody for brunch after giving them a call. While Celeste simply grinned, Jody was a little taken aback. Jimmy is a poor man. She still doesn't know who she was married to after all this time. That will probably wipe out the guild as well as all of them. It is unlikely that they will recover from a second controversy. After the chips fall, I'll help them get started up again, but I'll make damn sure they know it's the last time. When we arrived home, the most of us had already made our own plans. Everyone was going to provide moral support. Jim was attempting to maintain as much civility as possible by bringing in a couple of the new bodyguards. I lingered in the agency, taking in the sounds of the phones ringing. Jimmy appeared to be experiencing lingering doubts. Tonight, I guess I'll skip. Since Roy is returning home early, I can't afford to give him cause for concern. It's too late to make a mistake now. This caused the conspirators to exchange a lot of phone calls. The majority wanted her to attend. She was told not to by the Da's wife. You're acting like a sensible girl. No need to ruin our leisure time. Later on, we will have lots of time. She then burst out laughing. Additionally, it will be more for Janice and me. Tonight, break a leg. Philip and Jack were the only members of the group who were unaware of her plans. I will burn them all nonetheless. You pay to play. Jason glanced over and smiled. Hacker, I found you. It appears that your friend Philip works for an at company and has a degree in computer science. He'll most likely lose his job when the truth about what he did surfaces. Do you want to enjoy yourself? Jason Cross hacked all of Philip's accounts for an hour. He even posted the exchange about him and Jack being in love on his Facebook page, making sure to remove any mention of Jimmy. He said that he would always be in love with Jack and that they would be soulmates. It appears that Jason traced his electronic trail and found every cent they had taken thus far, suggesting that he wasn't as good as he believed. When this strikes, he's going to crap. I wish I could see his face. All I could do was smile. Please attend the play. When I tell him I got all my money back, you should see the look on his face. That night, as I sat in the car, I thought, showtime, in more ways than one. We were awaiting the curtains to rise and the lights to go out till the very last moment before we could go inside. My date for the evening caught me off guard. It was Philip's ex-wife Anne. She had to tell me who she was since I didn't recognize her. Her hair had turned golden and hung halfway down her back, and she had lost 50 pounds. It appears that she was nearing the end of her MMA fighting career when she got married to the man. Because of her size, she went by the combat name Catherine the Great. She competed in the heavyweight division and, while never winning, amassed a sizable fortune before retiring. Sadly, Philip took a large amount of it before she realized it. She determined whether he could cheat in a married relationship shortly after the altercation. Perhaps it would be wise to find out what more he was capable of. She managed to save slightly more than half of her possessions by catching him in time. She was mostly exempt from having to pay him alimony because of it. It appears he had already claimed half of the assets. Anne was a really beautiful woman, far prettier than I had remembered. However, when she crashed into me, all I saw of her was her body. I could still feel the sensation in her fist. During our conversation, I learned that she was skilled in two more techniques and had three black belts in various disciplines. She was a criminal justice graduate who had been a police officer until she grew weary of the politics. She told me she wouldn't mind a permanent position, but up until now she had worked as a bodyguard on a freelance basis and was glad to work for Jim. During our conversation, it dawned on me that my friendships and all of my investments over the years had been inadvertently directed toward this particular circumstance. Not what I meant to say when I said I do. I smiled, thinking about Jody's joke about my good fortune. Perhaps she was holding something. I handed Anne out of the van five minutes after the curtain opened, catching a sight of her four-inch heels. How can you fight wearing those? She smiled. I don't wear any strapped clothing. I can take these off quickly because they are slip-on. If I'm not in a rush, I occasionally leave them on. You'd be surprised at how someone may lose their battle when you stick a four-inch heel in their crotch. Okay, that's helpful to know. I didn't mind that she was a good three inches taller than me because of her heels. She chuckled, and I sincerely doubted that anyone would see me standing next to her. Normally, I dress professionally. Sometimes I like to get all dolled up. Regardless, you appear to believe that. I told her that I loved her clothing and that her cleavage was pretty much spot on. She described her tiny black dress as being high-low, with the cleavage being low and the thigh being high. I voted for it. Everyone else who watched us slide into our balcony seats voted for it. As the play went on, I took in my surroundings. My pals had made the choice to go all out, with every man dressed in a tux and every woman, as they put it, dulled to the nines. Jim was with his wife, who at 45 still had a fantastic body and seemed to sparkle from the silver in her hair. Jason had taken a new wife, whom he affectionately referred to as his little nerdette. She was wearing an exquisite dress. Her hair was the ideal complement to the purple outfit. Jody and Celeste escorted one another. It would have been a whole date if Jody had her way. This, I believe, was her first dress that I had ever seen. An outfit that maximized the definition of her muscular frame. Celeste looked just gorgeous as always. 
I asked Jimmy's agency supervisors to attend, but they declined. When I asked them not to fire her, they were a little taken aback. It wasn't her that took from you. She does a really excellent job, I think, so please keep her on board till the divorce is finalized. She would find it difficult to seek for help if she had a well-paying career. They conceded that she performed well. The other, more level-headed partner talked the first one out of wanting to fire her on the grounds of general principle. Everything relied on the level of media attention and negative reactions. The show, a parody of My Fair Lady, was rather wonderful. Jimmy seemed to radiate when I watched her perform live, and felt hurt by her seeming happiness. I wondered in 90 minutes what her look will be like. The male leads, Jack and Philip, deservedly received the most praise. There were 15 minutes of curtain calls. They vanished from sight backstage and then emerged into the foyer to be showered with praise from their admirers. Three of the bodyguards were serving as process servers, and I had two off-duty police officers there to make sure nothing went out of control. Twelve crimson flowers were carried by each. When Jimmy noticed me, she was thanking a fan and looked genuinely pleased to see me. She scowled and made her way toward me when I didn't approach. She was halted by a process server who informed her that the roses belonged to an admirer. Your name is Jimmy McCoy, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well then, this is also for you. She took a picture of Jimmy holding the large manila packet that she had given to her. I've taken care of you. Good night. She looked at me briefly as she stood there for a minute, trying to take in what was happening, and then she opened the package. There were other photos of the previous night's activities, the top one showing her between the Da's wife's legs while Philip plowed her from behind. While Janice, the woman, was blowing him, Jack was on his knees blowing the other guy. Jimmy remained silent. After giving me a brief glance, she rolled her eyes and passed out. As she completed some of the shots, the friends who were attempting to assist her were taken aback. When Jack saw the picture of him with the married Janice riding his face and the Dawes wife riding him in reverse cowboy pose, he appeared to want to pass out. Perhaps his pain was lessened by the million dollars I was requesting in the alienation suit. The Dawes wife, whose name escapes me to this day, simply rocked back and forth while repeatedly saying, no, no, no. With a cry, Janice fled the building. Philip's response caught my attention the most. In addition to the lawsuit's paperwork, he found a message informing him that the deputy attorney, the one he was abusing, was expecting a package outlining all of his illicit actions. He let go of the envelope and cast a wide glance before focusing on me. I will completely ruin you. He sprang forward, only to have Anne's heel slam into his groin. Oh my, it appeared just as agonizing as she had described. She leaned down, picked up a handful of hair, and hauled him halfway upright while he lay on the ground, moaning and clutching his groin. She smiled directly at him. Hello, my love. Miss me. Then she struck him in the face with her elbow. Though it was a bit excessive, our attorney said that it was all adrenaline related and that she believed he had made a menacing motion in the direction of her client. The police arrived. The paramedics arrived. It was exactly the same as before. With one exception, this was the final instance. My lawyer advised me to make myself unavailable for a few days so that the actual papers could be served. I never went back to the house because I had purchased it for Jimmy and had outgrown it. Ultimately, I paid her $50,000, the exact amount I had contributed to the infidelity fund during our marriage. In addition, I gave her the house and the last 10 years worth of payments. Since I had purchased the car for her birthday the previous year, I did gift it to her. She made roughly $175,000 in total assets. A respectable figure, but not nearly as much as what she had lost. She already knew the combination to the safe, therefore it was difficult for me to comprehend why she sought to rob the bank. She only needed to continue being devoted. She attempted to spin it, of course. Not that I was going to buy anything from her. During one of our rare chats, I questioned why she had accepted every falsehood without ever verifying if it was real. She might have hired a private detective, or even better, talked to me, with that money. She was at a loss for a definitive response. She gave up and signed the divorce papers one week before to the divorce. She was retained by the agency, but the cordial working relationship had ended and it was clear that she would never be able to climb above her current position at the time of the collapse. She took a job out of town and resigned, which was not surprising. Okay, so this is where I tell you all about how much fun I had with several partners who were all dying to comfort me. I didn't even bother to look at other women for at least a year. That much time was needed for me to gather my thoughts. My business associates and pals all remained close, particularly Celeste and Jody. They left me on my own after six months, deciding that I would be fine. Even so, I awoke and reached across the bed to grab Jimmy. Years of love fade over a very long period. I became a little anxious after the entire incident, so I reduced my investment activity and consolidated my cash flow. If something profitable arose, it would place me in a better position. Before I reduced my investment, I did make one more. The person who had inquired about the donut franchise gave a call to check on the status of the matter. When I told him a shortened version of what had transpired, he seemed utterly heartbroken. In exchange, he sent three dozen of each of his eight distinct donut flavors via expedited shipping to my office. When I got there, they were all heaped up in front of the door. 
I gathered as many people as possible for a taste test, and everyone agreed. They tasted the greatest they had ever experienced. Even Jody, the health guru that she was, attempted to smuggle in a dozen as she was going out. The donut with molasses was my favorite. It had to have at least 2 million calories and capable of instantly hardening arteries, but I couldn't stop eating them. Since the man was from Louisiana, I took a plane to see his operation. Due to the number of people, it took me 40 minutes to enter his one and only store in a tiny town. I had a donut and a cup of coffee that was unexpectedly delicious and powerfully flavored with chicory, another specialty of Louisiana. I introduced myself once the situation calmed down. His daughter turned out to be the counter manager, and she yelled into the back. Ants, here comes the money man. Sweat soaked and sporting a collapsed paper hat on his head, the guy bustled from behind. Any way you wanted to measure it, he was roughly 5'3". He was a Cajun from a little parish that no one had ever heard of, and although his speech was difficult to follow, he exuded energy and was quite endearing. When I tried to talk business, he cut me off. I am the donut maker. My daughter takes care of business. She believes that we might expand to four or five more stores around the state. You ought to speak with her. If she says all right, then we proceed. I have to return to work. That evening, I made an appointment for six o'clock, grabbed another donut, and headed out. It transpired that the meeting was held at her house. She served me a traditional Cajun meal, with most of the items being excellent but very spicy. There was her husband, back from his work on an oil rig. From the age of three to thirteen, she gave birth to three daughters. We worked things out after the dishes were cleared and we all had cups of the coffee I was starting to get dependent on. Initially, I was curious in how he developed the formulations and what enhanced their flavor. Pops creates all of his own flavorings, starting with vanilla. The majority of it is produced in 50-gallon food-grade drums, which need to sit for at least a year. If we decide to go into company together, we'll need to locate a large production facility. It could be a problem with the startup. Aside from ours, we currently have enough to operate three stores for a year. What number did you envision? When I told her, she almost passed out. You have no idea how unique your donuts taste, but three will do for a test market. My goal is to establish one in each of the state's cities with a population of at least 20,000. I assumed that after covering the South, we would move on to Texas, Alabama, and Georgia. I estimate that in five years we could be national and in some markets perhaps international. How does that sound? It sounds excessive. I'm not sure if my father will approve of that. Let's have a conversation and see. It took me around a month to persuade him to accept my suggestion. I received the most of the earnings because I was carrying the majority of the financial load. When I informed him I would include a buyout clause in the contract, worth 5% annually until he owned the entire amount, he eventually agreed. His first shop was exempt, and the startup contract was 70 over 30. That one he kept all to himself. Then, it was difficult to persuade him to concentrate on producing enough flavorings to keep the stores afloat. In order to prevent imitation, I had to legally secure the recipes and call in experts to explain how it operated. I added a sentence to the agreement saying that we would think about bottling and selling the flavors as a side gig at some point in the future. We launched a business in New Orleans eight months after we signed the contract. The marketing agency destroyed the locals' attempt to keep their talent a secret after they realized how great they were. They quickly became so busy that we had to open a second site specifically for making donuts. Next, we opened locations in Baton Rouge and Shreveport, particularly when a Food Network celebrity featured them on a show where it had gotten out. At the beginning of the broadcast, Celeste gave a disclaimer, stating that although I owned the majority of the stock, I had very little involvement in the donut-making process. She was a personal friend. Being a huge fan, Gaston was shocked that she was hosting a show about his modest business. The Taste Factory was working three shifts, and they were barely keeping up with us. They had to age for at least six months, according to Gaston, and if they failed his personal test, they had to stay in barrels. Once we were well established, I promoted Gaston's daughter to second in command and hired a reputable CEO. He had left retirement to train her, and he would return to it with a far greater retirement money as soon as he was satisfied with her progress. After that, I kind of vagued out. Well, I had to continue exercising or Jody would have killed me. I spent a lot of time traveling to far-off locations where I could sleep outside and take in the scenery. I was so happy with one trip that I had an agent search for land nearby thinking I may eventually build a holiday house that could eventually become a retirement home. I continued to attend meetings and check on all of my investments, but other than that, everything was going well, so I wasn't concerned. I hid my eye on the bar. Amy, Desiree, and Tina, known as the Terrible Three, requested a meeting. Amy walked me through it. For you, this location is a gold mine. We believe it's time for you to go out on your own. The work we've done here could help other towns. Locations like these, where we may feel comfortable, are desperately needed in our community. We've located a decent location after doing some investigation. We believe there won't be any opposition to our presence because of the excellent location in a progressive neighborhood with low crime rates. Would you think about it? Yes, we did. Jody made the decision that she would only like to be a small investor and not be involved. 
I presented it to them because I wasn't particularly interested either. Jody can invest another twenty, and I'll put up thirty. The remainder must be raised by you alone. We can't raise that kind of money. No, but you can borrow it. We don't have credit for that. I smiled. You do, really. It's mine to lend you. The interest rate will be prime plus one percent, and I'll keep the payments modest. If you need assistance, don't hesitate to call me, but this is your business. I took the documents out of my case and handed them to Amy once the sobbing and embracing ceased. After reviewing them, have a lawyer conduct to follow up. Once you sign them, everything is set. 5% a year until they owned it all was the buyout clause. Update. It was only Tina and myself in the office as I prepared to depart. Roy, can I ask a favor? It depends. What is the strap on size? Tina laughed. Avoid speaking too loudly. My partner adores my strap on, but he can be a jealous be too much information. 10 inches. What is the favor? We're have a prom next month. It's for all our people who for obvious reasons never got to attend one in high school. It's grown into a big deal. We had to rent the local college's gym and we've reached capacity. Well, almost. There is one set of tickets left. And, and we want you to take Amy. She's been on you since the first time she saw you. Her boyfriend just dumped her for a real girl. He said some pretty hurtful things to her as he left. She had been looking forward to the prom, and now she won't go. Tina, I, stop right there. We know you're not attracted to girls like us. If you ever were, we'd smother you. But you like Amy as a friend, and lots of friends go to events together. Give her a nice memory. That night, before I went to bed, I gave it some thought. I showed up at Amy's business the next morning, much to her surprise. She was the only owner and had ventured out on her own, therefore she dressed full-time. The majority of her clients were unaware. She got up from behind her desk. Roy, is something wrong at the club? I grasped her hand. Nothing wrong. Miss Amy, would you consider allowing me to be your escort to the prom? I happen to think I look pretty good in a tux and I'm sure you'll be beautiful. Well, she turned pale and I worried that she may pass out, but she bounced back well. All six of her staff members could hear us since she was leaving her door open. My, this is so sudden. Let me think. Yes, she flung her arms around my neck, revealing tears on her cheek that I could feel. Before she released me, I let her hold me for a very long time. I expect fine dining and a really nice corsage. Noted. Until then. As I was leaving, I believe her entire gang barged into her office. I sensed that the day would not be productive. At the scheduled time, I arrived in a limousine, corsage in hand. She was breathtakingly gorgeous. She wore a strapless black evening gown with a high split on her right thigh, shining blonde hair styled in an extravagant braid. When I gave her the keys to the limo, I caught a peek of her black garters. When we walked into the most expensive restaurant in town, we made a big impression. The women gazed in awe, the males staring with unabashed passion. We arrived at the location after a delicious but small dinner. The drinks were top quality, and the decorations were flawless. We sat at a table with Tina and her boyfriend, Desiree and her new husband, and, shockingly, Celeste and Aaron, who had been among the first people we'd met when we initially went to the pub. First, we had our group photo shot, then our individual photos with each other, and last, our couple's photo. The prom king and queen titles that Amy and I won were the high point. She sobbed the entire song during our highlight dance together. She withdrew once it was over and gave me a direct look. I love you. She observed my worried expression. Not like that. Well, maybe like that. If you liked girls like me, I'd have your ring on my finger before you knew what was going on. No, I love you for being the friend I needed when I needed one most. The friend who believes in me enough to loan me money for a business, and for making me believe it was all right to be who I am. I gave her a kiss. I bet she was surprised by it. I smiled when we split up. If I did like girls like you, you'd be my choice. I noticed a man with a hawk-like stare and ravenous eyes observing us. Even though he was quite bashful, he had the courage to approach Amy and request to dance. I advised him to ask the woman, and to his surprise, she said yes. We were on the floor, watching them. That's Robbie. He's still finding his way, trying to come to grips with being attracted to girls like us. He's got a major crush on Amy but is scared to death to do anything about it. Looks like he finally found some backbone. I watched them take out their phones after they performed two more dances. The evening buzzed to a close. This was, for many, the greatest night of their lives. When Robbie arrived, he misread the invitation to the after party. Even when the entire audience was going, I bowed out. I'm leaving pretty early tomorrow. I wouldn't mind Amy going if she had someone to look over her. Could you do that for her, Robbie? Understand that if she gets hurt you'll be the one I come looking for. I gazed at Amy as he stammered through his reassurance. You sure? Remember, we came as friends. You go have fun. I expect to hear good things about the rest of the night. She sprang into my arms, crushing my bones with an embrace, then clamped down on Robbie's hand. I was taken aback when Celeste asked me to drop her off. Her date had managed to secure a different after-party and escort. We entered the limousine. The driver didn't say anything if he saw that I departed with someone other than who I had arrived with. Where are you staying? With you. I didn't make any reservations. I was going to stay with Desiree and her husband. 
Yes, you're stuck with me. I can think of worse fates. In response, she slid beneath my arm. She moaned as I planted a kiss on her cheek. We had gone to bed. She was sipping room service coffee on the sweet sofa when I woke up. She was wearing only one of my dress shirts. She was unsure, but when I kissed her quite well, she became comfortable. There better be some coffee for me. Grinning, she poured me a cup from the carafe that I had missed before. We relaxed in quiet conversation until our drinks were gone. Then the questioning began. What happened last night? She smiled. Destiny. She told me I'd spent too much time with the tea girls when she stopped laughing. My feeling, honey, is that we're good together. I have no reservations telling you I've wanted you for years. I've also seen the way you look at me when you think I'm not paying attention. Admit it. There's good chemistry between us. We relaxed, and then she grinned. We broke a shower rod. I'm glad the suite is in your name and not mine. Let's go take a shower together. When I received the bill, you would have assumed that a rock band had stayed the night. All I did was smile and pay it. Four months passed throughout the courtship. At the moment, all I was doing was watching the money come in. To promote her book, she continued to tour and film her concerts. I followed around for a few times before realizing Celeste was employed when she was there. She would pose for photos and sign books for five hours, not leaving until the final book was closed and everyone was happy. She identified me as her partner a few times. Everyone automatically thought we were life partners, even though I understood she meant business partner, at least, I believe she did. It's possible that the little PDAS somewhat changed their perspectives. We had several sleeps together. I mean her, we did all we could think of. For the most part, it was delightful. I wouldn't even attempt some. We spoke extensively about our pasts. Compared to mine, hers was far more vibrant. We talked about her swinging days for over an hour. I'm sure you know that it was 90% Jack, but he's a persuasive guy and after a while I started to enjoy it. Deep down, though, I knew the moment I let another man touch me that the clock was ticking. We would never last. 90% of swingers divorce fairly early and I believe in my heart it was because we gave up the intimacy, the ownership, for lack of a better word, of a committed couple. It ended up being just physical functions. Sometimes they were enjoyable physical functions, but when we were done, we were done. Rarely did anyone want to snuggle when it was over, not even the spouses. Jack was usually so drained he was asleep in minutes, afterwards. It sounds like fun and games but it can be a pretty lonely life. She inhaled deeply once more. All that being said, the past is the past. The relationships post-Jack were always monogamous. If a partner even hinted about swinging, and a few did because I told them up front about my past, we were through, pretty much right then. And a couple of relationships were with women. It was one of the few pleasant things to come out of the period. Then she wrapped herself about me. I won't promise you this, I will guarantee it. If we end up together permanently, it will be just that, together permanently. No others. Till death do us part, and I mean it. I was still undecided. I believed that I had harbored feelings for Celeste for quite some time. I was a little scared by her background, and occasionally I worried if she was thinking about former partners when we were together. That was never a problem for me. I was completely engrossed in the act of performing if I was with a lady. I had not before given anyone any thought. I tried all in my power to fulfill my partner's wishes. To be honest, there were moments when I would remember what we had done and how much better it had always worked with her when I had done the same thing with someone else. Our relationship was beginning to suffer as a result of my uncertainty. The previous time we'd been together, she'd dropped a lot of clues, and I hadn't answered her as effectively as I might have. I hadn't seen her in two weeks after her abrupt departure. Then one evening I noticed headlights approaching my driveway. Update. I had purchased a few acres near the lake that I cherished. Though I didn't have lakefront, I did have access to the water. I seldom ever utilized my power boat. Instead, I would rather go kayaking in the quiet of the early morning. Before the large boats made the lake too turbulent, I would be able to get a decent paddle in. It was off the beaten path, but I'd turned one of the bedrooms into an office and, thanks to the internet, could conduct most of my business from home. My four-bedroom Cedar Ranch-style house had plenty of amenities, including a pool, hot tub, and a really nice patio with a gas grill, a charcoal grill, a fire pit, and a clay oven. I put on a robe as I was about to enter the hot tub and went to see who it may be. When I recognized it was Celeste, my heart gave a small jump, and then I noticed she was carrying someone. It was Anne. Because she had a stalker, she had employed her on book tours a few times. They got along and became pals. When Celeste tried to kiss me, I could tell she had been drinking. She was walking, taking off her clothing, and I was walking after her, scooping them up. With a sigh, she carefully lowered her lovely figure into the tub. Oh, this feels so good. Come on in, guys. My mouth dropped to the patio as I turned to apologize to Anne. Though Anne was behind me and I was unaware of it, she had been undressing at a rate as quick as Celeste. She was a woman who was as hard as a rock. She approached me with her muscles rippling, perfectly toned and sculpted. I had a sneaking suspicion Jody would adore her. She grabbed my hand as she went by and practically pulled me into the tub. Without time to remove the robe, I quickly had the feeling that I was wearing weights. So I stood up and dismissed it. Celeste laughed and Anne made a remark. You're right, see it looks like the perfect size. 
They felt as though they had locked us in a vacuum as they pressed up against me. Grabbing my face, Celeste drew me into a kiss. When she released her grip and followed suit, I withdrew as she released her grip. What? Celeste's laughing stopped. She gave me a lifeless stare. This is my last attempt to get you to commit. Since you haven't given me a commitment, I'm still a free agent. This is it. If you commit it will be my final encounter with a woman. If you don't it will be my last time with you. Either way, I want us all to have a good time. Stop thinking and start loving. I pondered this for approximately two seconds. Celeste was accurate. We hadn't made an official statement about being exclusive. We weren't hurting anyone and we were all single if we wanted to play with someone else. I retract that statement. The next day I felt sore, I could hardly move. We tried every possible combination. Celeste's body was pushed against my, her head resting on my chest when I woke up. Standing at the foot of the bed, clothed and fresh from her shower, was Anne. Thanks Roy. I always wondered what you and Celeste would be like in the sack and now I know. Her grin was melancholic. This was her last hurrah, Roy. If you can't commit or if you don't love her, turn her loose. As hot and loving as she is she'll find someone pretty quick. In an attempt to keep Celeste from waking up, I eased out of bed, forgetting I was nude. I smiled as I looked down at myself. Nothing that Anne hadn't already observed up close. Be right back. I went to my wall safe, entered the combination, and took out a little package. When I cracked it open, Anne's eyes grew quite large. Celeste, honey, wake up and tell Anne bye. She cracked an eye open and moaned. That close to her face, I hoped the ring looked enormous. I've reached a decision, honey. If you'll have me, I'd like. We landed on the floor in a tangle of blankets while Anne snapped shots with her phone. She was on me so quickly. After posting the better ones right away, her phone started to light up in 30 minutes. Update. While sorting through the wedding cards, I came across one that was nameless. You and Celeste are meant to be together. I hope she brings you happiness. Warm regards, Jimmy. Following her departure from the agency, Jimmy had vanished for some time. She returned one day with a new partner. It was Swingers, and it lasted for around half a year. She vanished once more, and upon her return, she established her own agency. Her former employers delegated minor tasks to her, and she enlisted their assistance for undertakings requiring more resources than she could gather. She dated for a year before getting married to a man she met while working on his campaign. I presented them with a wedding gift. 1% of the franchise for donuts. Though it may not seem like much, the annual change was a welcome addition. It was my hottest moneymaker, and I felt a bit bad about taking it from her when she found it. They now have a little daughter. After being served for alienation of love, Jack suddenly vanished, and not even Anne is aware of his whereabouts. She never had a reason to want to know, but she could if she wanted to. Philip did not fare well. Since I would have also needed to charge Jimmy, I decided not to pursue charges. She was always a naive and vulnerable lady, never the genius. They only received around twenty grand, and I received my entire investment back. I did provide his supervisors a thorough explanation of how he had utilized corporate computers and resources for illicit purposes, and they promptly fired him and made public the reason why. Reputable companies wouldn't work with him. He used the dark web to get unprotected machines and demand ransom payments until he made a mistake and compromised a well-known author. After exhausting all efforts to locate him, his publishing business handed him up to the federal government. He was sentenced to seven years and one month of parole when he got into a fight with another prisoner. In the end, he had to serve out his entire sentence plus an additional 18 months. His tiny body and attractive features made me worry sometimes how he was doing in prison. He must have given every part he was required to perform his all. When Celeste noticed me holding the card, she inquired as to its origin. I threw it in the garbage. You're wearing that I know something you don't grin, old business associate. What's going on? I'm running 10 days behind schedule. Tomorrow, I'm going to get one of those house kits. That's good for us, then. My comment, still puzzled why Jimmy fell a second time with the same knuckleheads. What was all the counseling and reconciliation efforts for? Jimmy has mental issues. Did you like the ending? Comment down below, sub and bell and I will see you in the next video.